Over to you, Jagdish. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Shrikant. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here for this uh, event. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce uh, uh, Matthew Kahn, which is difficult to do, but I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to give a little bit of context to some of the things that I find uh, very interesting in his work and how that connects with some of the things that that I that that we are pursuing uh, in our uh, uh, in our School of Environment and Sustainability and the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. So, um, so Matthew Kahn is a uh, of course, a, a provost, provost professor of economics at the University of Southern California. And he has a, a pedigree in the London School of Economics and University of Chicago. And he's taught at, uh, at Stanford, Harvard, and the uh, National University of Singapore. And uh, he has published 10 books. And the, the, the titles of some of these books, I mean, I can't actually wait to get hold of a few of them um, as soon as I can, because uh, so one, you know, a couple of them that caught my is, uh, you know, of course, the Green Cities, Urban Growth and Environment, uh, 2006, which I think would be an essential reading for anybody interested in, in urban transformation and, and urban environmental aspects. Um, Blue Skies Over Beijing, Economic Growth and Environment in China. Again, something very relevant for, for, uh, for fast uh, growing um, uh, economies and and also with great relevance for uh, India. Then um, and some an, a, another book that I think is uh, uh, Heroes and Cowards: The Social Face of War. That's something that uh, shows the the breadth of of uh, of Professor Khan's interests and and views and and things. But I also want to now mention a little bit about the the book uh, that. Uh, that uh, is the adapting to climate change, which came out uh, just in 2000, March 2021. Um, markets and the management of an uncertain future. And if you look at uh, at the at the topics that are mentioned, uh, it's so comprehensive. Uh, it's uh, it starts with microeconomics. Uh, there's a chapter on daily quality of life, something that is uh, um, you know that you don't often see uh, in, in, a, in a textbook. Protecting the poor, uh, upgrading of public infrastructure, reimagining real estate uh, sectors, and also laws and legislation, as well as innovation and agricultural production. I mean, and, uh, and also about how climate change uh, is going to impact economic productivity. So this is basically uh, something that is going to be very important for us uh, in in uh, in India, because uh, you know, as an ecologist, environmental scientist, we always felt um, a city as part of the problem, and all our work on in ecology was in distant mountains, rivers, and forests. But now, those those uh, all those uh, forests, rivers, and mountains are very close to expanding urban spaces, and so we have to grapple with the challenge of uh, of finding solutions in the urban transformation for both in terms of climate change mitigation and especially in terms of adaptation with co-benefits. So uh, urban spaces have to become an arena for, for rigorous uh, knowledge generation, experiments, and innovation. And I think that uh, uh, Professor Khan is the best person to introduce us to this. Uh, and, and another thing that struck me about the book is that you know it reads like a you can read it like a novel because it doesn't have uh, all those uh, very complicated graphs and tables that uh, that usually clutter up many other types of books on on similar uh, topics. So, without any further uh, delay, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Khan take over. Um, and um, uh, you have some slides to share, uh, uh, Professor Khan. And then uh, I think that we you can we can have uh, you can finish your slides. And then we can have a short uh, break where we can, you know, for people to gather their thoughts, maybe, and then we can go on to the discussion and questions. Is, is that uh, fine, uh, Matt? That's perfect. Jagdish, thank you very much. And it's great to meet everyone. And Aparna, it's so good to see you again. And I am, I'm delighted to be here and to have this opportunity. I'm going to share my screen. Or this will stop other screen sharing. 
folks, I'm having, so I want to share my screen. Ah, here it is. And I'm going to go to slideshow. Folks, I'm, I hope you can see my screen. And the good news is I have 19 slides. And I think uh, some of them are interesting. And please email me with any thoughts and comments, because I'm very eager. I have visited India once, and I'm very eager. I'm going to talk to you about some of my new research on India today related to my book. So folks, you all know this picture. I am so worried about the challenge of climate change, and that's one of the reasons that I started to work on climate change adaptation of as Mother Nature throws harder punches at us, how do we adapt? And so, folks, this is not economics. This is a graph from 1960 to roughly the present of global uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide. And it, this is basically a linear slope. We have not bent this curve. I tremendously hope that we will bend this curve. But as of right now, we are running this ugly experiment of ever rising greenhouse gas emissions. And let me bring this down for everyone to look at. I am worried. I very much hope that the green greening of our economy and of India's economy occurs. But I believe that global greenhouse gas emissions will continue to rise. I'm well aware that we are decarbonizing the energy grid. I'm well aware that Elon Musk and, and, and Indian car manufacturers are producing electric vehicles. But there's a huge demand for energy in the developing world and all sorts of interesting studies have been written in economics about the growth in demand for energy and for and fossil fuels continue to be a cheap source of energy and we need the emerging middle class in the world to consume more energy to achieve their goals and what we are, take for granted uh, and so uh, um, the american dream is very energy intensive and i think that it's crucial for people in the developing world to have access to the same services that Americans take for granted. And so unfortunately, I believe that greenhouse gas emissions will rise. I support a carbon tax. We can talk about the political economy of enacting carbon taxes, and I'm actually working on that issue. But one of the reasons that I started to work on the climate change adaptation issue is my deep concern that, unfortunately, we are running this experiment of ever rising greenhouse gas emissions. And so, folks, here is the cover of my book that did not come out very well. This is a U.S. focused book. And so in this very brief talk, I'm going to walk you through the big ideas of my book and then relate them to the challenges and opportunities uh, that India faces as it urbanizes and grows richer. Folks, my starting point in my book is an economic point that, uh, as Marty Weitzman taught us, the famous Harvard economist, we do face fat tail risk from climate change, but we are not passive victims. While there's many known unknowns about the risks that climate change poses, we are not passive victims here. My teacher, the Nobel laureate Robert Lucas, argued in some famous work from 45 years ago that the Lucas critique, as governments change, the, the, it, as governments change their policies, households and firms reoptimize to to make their best responses uh, to changes in the rules. Folks, something I want you to think about is as Mother Nature changes the laws of the temperature distribution, of rainfall, of extreme events, that people, households, firms, and governments will change their behavior. And, and of course, there will be cost to adaptation, but will make choices to protect the, themselves from the new risks we face. And I'm going to come back to some evidence on this claim later in the context of India. So an overview of my book. And so rather than asking you to read my book, I'm going to give you the 15 minute version. Each of us seeks to be healthy, comfortable and to raise happy children. Climate change threatens all of these goals. And thus, uh, and thus uh, families and firms face strong incentives to think through what strategies can protect against this. Folks, 
what I take very seriously is the human capital hypothesis. Um, India features so many educated people and an ever-growing count of educated people and great universities. The United States has had great universities. Of the rule of ingenuity, when we know we face a challenge, how do we use markets and government intervention to help to protect us? Another theme in my book, is how do we structure government's rules? And I'll give some specific examples in a couple of minutes. How do we come up with government rules? For example, California faces drought right now. Uh, um, if California doesn't allow water prices to rise, that's an example of a bad rule because that creates bad incentives to adapt to drought. I'm gonna offer a series of empirical hypotheses for how to measure whether we're making progress in adapting. And I want those of you who remember the old bet between Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich, I want you to think about my project as the sequel to the bet. So like in those Rocky movies with Sylvester Stallone, there were all these sequels. I want, I'm, I'm, I view myself as the new Julian Simon. Paul Ehrlich is a very great ecologist, um, but, but um, Julian Simon offered a narrative of, about human ingenuity and and to some degree, climate change adaptation revisits the bet. I start my book by discussing the microeconomic perspective of measuring climate change risk. The challenge is this is a moving target. So to give an example, Miami, Florida is susceptible to sea level rise, but we don't know when it's gonna occur or how severe it will be. There are very interesting issues of risk perception and of whether people who are thinking of investing in such real estate are aware of the new emerging risks. And there's a fight in economics between rational expectations economists, behavioral economists, and those who, who advocate adopting a robust decision framework. And let me spend a minute on that. If we know that we don't know the probability distributions of risks, it can be a, 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 a a low regret strategy is to try to do the best you can in the worst case scenarios, and that's robust decision making. And so in the second chapter of my book, I talk about how um, the perception versus reality issue of if climate change is, and I believe it is, changing the stochastic distribution of risks we face, are people in Bayesian updaters updating their beliefs? Or are they using old rules of thumb and underestimating the new risks we face? In the next chapter of the book, as Jagdish discussed, I talk about daily quality of life. I live in Los Angeles. Los Angeles faces greater wildfire risk. It faces drought because of climate change. I talk about the specific challenges my family faces, and we're a well-to-do family of, of how middle-class people and poor people face challenges from the new risks that have arisen. I think I have a very good chapter, and this is an American-focused book, on how the poor are affected by extreme events. A theme I emphasize in my poverty chapter is that a, a, an adaptation strategy is to reduce poverty. Um, and I talk about Jim Heckman's work on human capital, Gary Becker's work on investing in skill. If people have greater incomes, this is a resilient strategy. We all know that the poor live in, in the most risky parts of cities and they live in lower quality housing and they don't have access to savings when shocks occur. And so a crucial issue that every society is going to face is how to protect the poor from the new shocks we face. The middle part of the book discusses urban infrastructure. And folks, because the United States is an urbanized nation, 80% of Americans live in cities and suburbs. And of course, India is urbanizing. 80% of Americans live in cities and suburbs. Something that interests me very much is the following. The New York Times often makes a claim that, that Republican areas are slow to invest in adaptation. And that, and that there's an implicit assumption that there, it, let me say it like this. What I discuss in this chapter on urban public infrastructure is America has a system of cities. You can vote with your feet to move to those cities that best match 
what you want in terms of quality of life and jobs. If a Republican city mayor does not take climate change seriously and does not upgrade the airports, does not improve infrastructure for levees and roads and sewer treatment, that city is going to be less competitive. And so a point I make is that competition is very important. If a city mayor chooses to underinvest in resilience, that city will suffer a brain drain as natural disasters decimate that city. And so an important idea that I want everyone thinking about is the benefits of competition, that, that, that the threat of losing your tax base nudges states and localities to think through increasing investments in resilience. That brings me to my next chapter. Will climate change threaten economic productivity? I think that this is very important for India and the United States. Folks, Nick Bloom at Stanford University has been doing very interesting work on manager quality. I think of superstar firms like Tesla, like Amazon. Um, we, in the US superstar economy, we have very large firms controlling ever larger shares of their industries. In terms of adapting to climate change, that's actually a good thing because I argue in this chapter, and perhaps this is a little bit elitist, a Jeff Bezos is going to have the best managers, the access to the best data, and is going to think through and is going to hire the best consultants to help him plan for his company so that if they have an HQ2, in choosing where to locate their headquarters, they're not gonna locate in a city that's at risk. They're gonna do their homework. In contrast, smaller firms with lower quality managers are more likely to be decimated by climate shocks. And the issue that arises is the workers at those firms are gonna become more likely to be unemployed. And there's a question of transition dynamics of how quickly can they match with another firm. And so I have a good chapter in the book on comparative advantage. What types of managers are nimble enough to handle shocks versus what types of managers are sort of sluggish and sort of asleep at the wheel? My next chapter is protecting urban real estate. And folks, I wrote a piece that in the United States, people have liked my piece, and I want to spend a minute here. What my piece is about is this nascent industry in the United States. So folks, Moody's and Standard & Poor are rating agencies that of course rate Wall Street assets for their credit worthiness. What's going on in the United States right now, and I'd love to see this in India, is that there be climate rating firms. So I am doing research with an entity called First Street Foundation, which is for every parcel of land in the United States, it is providing predictions about flood risk over the next couple decades. And so this is sort of an early warning system. If we trust their models, the new climate rating industries are providing signals to real estate developers of where is higher ground. And if we can change our zoning code to upzone in those areas, this is how more of us can adapt. If we can identify higher ground, upzone in those areas and build more housing there, that's a way that capitalism and new markets can work together to help us to adapt. In the back end of the book, and I just referred to this, I have a long chapter on the role of big data. Uh, all of you have a cell phone and just the amazing information we have at our fingertips uh, to better understand the real-time risks we face. And data scientists are using our cell phone data on our geo coordinates of where we are at each moment of the day to learn about what risks we face. Um, so, for example, my friends at the World Bank told me a story that after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, people, um, researchers used people's cell phone coordinates to, to count how many people who were in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria hit, where were they living eight months later? And so I thought that was a terrific example of how to use cell phone latitude and longitude coordinates to study how people adapt to natural disasters. A moment ago, I mentioned that in the United States and in every country, we, we will be better able to adapt to sea level rise and to flood risk if scientists can identify higher ground and if urban planners push through 
the politics to upzone in areas that are safe. Two more points here before I wrap up my book. Another policy the United States needs to adapt to climate change is we need road pricing. Americans, and I saw this when I was in India, in Americans are stuck in traffic. In Los Angeles, you're often stuck in traffic. The inability to move at the speeds that you can in Singapore means that we have to live very close to where we work and shop. If we could move at higher speeds in cities, we would have so much more freedom those who are risk averse could live in safer parts of the city and still access work and shopping. There'd be so many more permutations of how we could configure our cities if we could move at higher speed. In addition to pricing the roads, we also need to price water and electricity to reflect their scarcity. Water is too cheap in California and there, thus there's no incentive to economize on this. So as an economist, I go crazy saying, it, it, for, for the first lesson of economics is if we face scarcity, the price should rise. And if the price of water increased in California, farmers would grow less alfalfa, would use the water more wisely, and, we, and th the costs of drought would be lower. Globalization is the last chapter I want to talk about. I am well aware that developing countries are going to suffer from climate shocks. The developed world is aging. We actually need much more international migration. I talk in one of the back chapters of my book of how to use ideas from economics on mechanism design, the Nobel laureate Al Roth, how we use ideas from mechanism design to have more orderly migration such that people can get from their origin to destinations that would welcome them. With more trade in agricultural goods across nations, nations will suffer less if they have a bad harvest because international trade unbundles uh, production from consumption. And of course, with international capital markets, more money would flow to the developing world from Wall Street as, as those with capital are looking for a high rate of return. In the second part of my talk, I now want to pivot to India and I want to talk about topics that interest me very much, and some of which I'm working on to start a discussion and to hopefully make some new friends. Folks, as I think about India, and I'm an urban economist, my starting point is that India is urbanizing and that this is terrific news in terms of adapting to climate change. I understand that an unintended consequence of India's urbanization is that India's greenhouse gas emissions rise. With my focus on adaptation, I'm excited that India will suffer less from climate change because it's urbanizing. The urban sector is less exposed to climate than the farming sector. Urbanites are richer than rural people. And with income, one has the ability to self-protect, to own an air conditioner, to own a refrigerator, to live in higher quality housing, to, to consume higher quality food. And urbanization and education go hand in hand. People will invest more in their education when they expect to live their lives in cities. And as India's human capital increases, that this will have, a, in my opinion, will have a causal effect on helping more of the nation to be resilient. Folks, I wanna talk about the system of cities and in, with, in work with my friends at the World Bank, we're discussing the following. India has hundreds of cities. If there was a benevolent planner who sought to protect India's urbanites, which cities in India are more temperate? Which cities have a natural advantage and have a leadership advantage to better cope with emerging climate risks? Which cities have a flexible land use regulation? Among those cities that have a comparative advantage in being able to adapt to the new risks, are those cities able to build more housing or are there interest groups who are blocking such housing? Many poor people in India live in slums. I'm very interested in, in heterogeneity of which slums across India face the greatest climate risks, and are the local residents aware of these risks, and do they have any access to successful self-protection strategies? Daron Asselmoglio and Josh Lin wrote this great pharmaceutical paper where they argued that aggregate demand 
um, cr induces endogenous innovation. Uh, to, to translate that into simple English, in, if enough people in India are suffering from climate risks, will some entrepreneurs get very rich devising solutions that help people to successfully adapt? Folks, a big debate in urban economics is the following. If you want to protect urban poor people or, and urban people in general, do you help people or do you help the place? When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005, there was a question of do you rebuild New Orleans or do you give housing vouchers to help people to migrate away from New Orleans? So folks, in the case of India, something I'd like to learn is the economics of a, to protect vulnerable people, do we do you invest? And I realize the answer is going to be both. To protect vulnerable people who live in vulnerable places, do you try to increase the mobility of the vulnerable people to encourage them to move to higher ground? Or do you invest in infrastructure to protect the place? This issue arose in East and West Germany. When East and West Germany unified, there was Harold Uhle wrote an interesting paper that an unintended consequence of subsidies of East Germany paid by West German taxpayers was actually to slow down the transition. So an unintended consequence of being generous to the unproductive place is you actually injured the nation because you slowed down a transition that had to occur. My friend Mushfik and his co-authors wrote a very interesting paper in Bangladesh that you can protect rural people by increasing their mobility. He, his team gave out these randomized bus passes during the monsoon season, and they documented that when you randomly hand out bus passes, people send a child to the city to work, and that yes, smooths their him. income. And so this is an example of how you protect people from place-based shocks. Hello. In my own work with my co-authors, we have been very interested in how do we create government rules without crowding out private investment? So is it the case, it, it would be a shame if when government invests in resilience, that actually leads people to reduce their investments in self-protection. I'll give an example. If in a Miami, Florida, if a, a seawall is built, do more people move to the area because they feel safe? That would be an example of government investment in infrastructure crowding out private self-protection. And that was the theme of this paper by Kowski, Lutmer, and Zeckhauser. Uh, we will be better able to adapt to climate change if government investments are a complement, not a substitute for private investment. And so I'm very interested in cases such as if the government makes an investment making an area safer, if private, that can be a complement of private actions. If, if insurers in the area um, also make investments to incentivize people to take further precautions. Folks, I want to tell you a little bit about my new work in India, because in my Big Think talk, I'm not going to show you any results. I'm just at the start of this research agenda. In new work with several co-authors of mine, Sahil, Rajat, Shamik, and Vahidi, we are taking a new look at research examining the impact of flood events on cities. We are using lights at night satellite data to explore when major floods occur, do cities in richer nations suffer less and recover faster from these events? We are studying also whether pop, the population is, is choosing not to move to areas that are at greater risk of climate shocks based on their topography. Finally, as the last bullet point says, we're also interested in this crowding out effect. When governments invest in dams and other infrastructure meant to protect the population from risks, does that have the unintended consequence of more people moving to the area? And so if this is the case, um, this work is policy relevant for informing authorities to anticipate the full consequences of their actions before they make an upfront infrastructure investment. Folks, uh, this is, um, 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but this is the golden triangle that Sh Shamek and I are working on. And this gets at a series of strategic decisions. Areas in India will be better able to adapt to climate change if people are investing in their own self-protection, protecting their homes, but also if people are able to access market insurance so that if a disaster occurs, they get a payout to allow them to get back on their feet. In this setting, it's very interesting to me, should the government be actively involved in subsidizing insurance? Uh, the government, of course, will be paying for basic infrastructure, so what I want to signal to you is in my ongoing work in the United States, but also in many important countries, including India, I want to be much more involved in the microeconomics of how do we build up resilience? And when is it the case that government and firms and households are on the same page working together versus when does government actions crowd out private efforts, as I've now said twice? I also have new work on where do the poor live in cities. With my co-authors listed uh, on the previous slide, we are examining for major cities that have experienced major floods, where do the poor and non-poor live in these cities? And is it the case that the poor disproportionately suffer more and only more slowly recover from the shock? The adaptation hypothesis posits that even slum dwellers are not passive victims here. And the, my adaptation hypothesis is that we're getting better and better at adapting such that the same punch by mother nature causes less damage as we have more human capital and as we are richer and have more education to be, be and have more market products to be able to adapt. My conclusion. Starting with my 2010 Climatopolis book and this new book, I have posited an ironic and optimistic adaptation thesis. Because climate change is such a serious threat, self-interested households and governments will use their ever-growing set of strategies to build up our collective resilience. The COVID crisis, as horrible as it's been and continues to be, has only furthered my optimism about our adaptive capacity. The Nobel laureate Paul Romer has emphasized that ideas are public goods. Once we have an idea that it can be replicated everywhere, because the whole world is grappling with very similar climate change issues, and because there's roughly 8 billion of us, there's tremendous experimentation to learn what works. And once we have these blueprints, they can be replicated at low marginal cost around the world. My last slide. I am very, very excited about the new empirical research coming out in India by terrific scholars. Uh, and my, so what I've listed here are two important papers that estimate climate damage functions. And I realize I haven't written out any statistics in this crazed talk today. What these great scholars are doing is they are asking, so in the first paper, they're exploring at the firm level how productivity of firms and workers is affected by high heat. The, the adaptation hypothesis posits that the slope of that gradient is going to shrink over time, that on extremely hot days in the future in India's manufacturing plants, that there's going to be less of a reduction in productivity and damage to labor supply from the heat. That's the adaptation hypothesis. And the paper by Burgess, Olivier, Dave, and Michael documents that in India, across the decades, for non-poor people, extreme heat has caused less and less death as non-poor people have had increased access to air conditioning and other strategies to protect themselves. And so I think with that note, Jagdish, I'm going to stop sharing. I am having a senior moment. And I hope that I kept us on time. Thanks, Matt. That's a lot of ground covered. <laughs> um, while we are uh, waiting for uh, you know some of the questions which are coming in, I just wanted to just mention uh, one of the 
um, you know, the the in, in Delhi has a, a lot of environmental problems, including air quality, but also another aspect is the water. Uh, the Yamuna floodplain, for example, has been an area arena of, of both judicial as well as uh, environmental activism. And uh, and right now, the the there is an aspiration of uh, of certain sections of of society in Delhi to access to urban biodiversity and aesthetics uh, related to that. And, and all these biodiversity parks are coming up in the Yamuna floodplain. So that would something that, you know, many of us would welcome from, from point of view. But there's also an intervention that the farmers in the floodplain uh, were, were posed as part of the problem, unfortunately, uh, rather than as part of the solution because the floodplains have been used by a lot of farmers. And, uh, and and so there is this now uh, posing one type of environmental view with, with another one, which looks at the uh, agriculture in the floodplains and maybe transforming that to more organic um, and less chemical intensive agriculture in the future. That as part of the solution rather than, and then displacing farmers and, and making, uh, making the entire floodplain into some sort of a regulated uh, uh, protected zone. So, so some of these debates are already uh, happening in many of our uh, city spaces. So I just wanted to mention that. Then um, we can now, I think the first question um, is uh, from Yamini Gupta. And she wanted to find out what is exactly improved risk pricing. Maybe, maybe with an example or two, you could uh, illustrate that, uh, Professor Khan. So this is a great question. So I have been talking to some insurers, and of course what actuaries do is in a stationary environment, uh, they will calculate for, for all 20-year-old male drivers in California, um, what's the probability of a crash per thousand miles of driving? And if that probability is higher, then those in that category will be charged more for insurance. Um, if I understood the question correctly, a key issue in the case of climate change would be, uh, and in the United States, FEMA is wrestling with this, for different parcels of land, what is, when natural disasters occur, what flooding occurs, what's the probability of, that, of, of the shock? How is that changing over time? And what's the damage when that shock occurs? Um, so did she want to follow up there that um, a point I've made in my work is, is if governments put price caps on insurance, then the insurance industry is going to unravel. If climate change raises the probability of horrible events, insurers have to be able to risk price to not go broke. And I've in California right now, are you guys aware that insurers are not allowed to drop coverage in fire zones and they're not allowed to raise prices in fire zones. And so what that means is those who don't live in fire zones are cross subsidizing those people who live in fire zones. And that's a terrible incentive because if we risk price, if in California, those who want to live in a fire zone, I think they should have to pay more for their insurance because that would nudge them to live in a safer part of the city. So, uh, so Jagdish, I would ask if she wants to follow up. I claim that it's crucial to risk price and for government not to have price caps on insurance because if insurance is actuarially fair and reflects the risk, that actually nudges people to move economic activity to relatively safer places. Thanks, uh, Matt. Uh, I I'm going to go to the second question uh, from Gayatri Kunte. Uh, she thanks you for the insights today. Um, the question is, what time frame do you envision for demand for climate adaptation technology to rise in developing countries to the level that exists in developed economies? And the follow-up is also, if Indian cities have higher resilience to adapt to climate change, what solutions would you suggest for India's rural sector to adapt to climate change? So these are fantastic questions. I, Aparna, I'd love to work on that first question with you. Uh, so we'll see if Aparna is willing to work with me again. But, um, but, but our first paper, I think, has like 100 citations. So my wife and I, and my wife is an economist, we, we often talk 
about the Boskin report that that products be quality adjusted products become cheaper and cheaper. And so so I would want to know what's the price of an air conditioner in India. And if you, we were to form a consumer price index for quality adjusted air conditioners, are they getting cheaper in India? And, and Aparna, coming back to international trade, is India producing its own air conditioners or is it importing those? So, so that would be an example of how I would want to work with you guys on that first question of, Matt has been saying, oh, because of capitalism, adaptation friendly products are getting cheaper and cheaper. But if I'm a poor guy in India, are, are they so cheap that, that I can afford them? And I actually don't know the answer to that. Uh, so Aparna, if I can ask you a question, has there been work in India on, on the CPI of durables getting cheaper and cheaper? Cars in China are getting cheaper and cheaper. Has there been work in India on, on durable goods getting cheaper and cheaper because of trade and mass production? Uh, in terms of looking at energy efficiency of uh, certain durables and specifically for air conditions, yes, there has been uh, some headway. Uh, in terms of the first part that you were asking, whether we are producing versus uh, importing, uh, well, no, we have indigenous technology in air conditioners. So the market adaptation is sort of there in terms of making one feel that we are uh, conscious of the environment and therefore we are going in for more energy efficient uh, products, but not to the extent I think that you're thinking in terms of uh, a more large scale adaptation, uh, climate adaptation, but I think the beginnings are certainly there. Yeah. Uh, Jagdish, could I ask for a favor? I, I'm having a senior moment. Can you read me the second question? I thought it was, I, I have forgotten. Yeah, yeah the second part of, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, Gayatri's question was, uh, if Indian cities have higher resilience to adapt to climate change, what solutions would you uh, suggest for India's rural sector to adapt? So, so something I discuss with my students is, is the harris Tadaro two-sector model. Um, so let me let me say this and throw this out to my new friends. In, as people move from the countryside to the city, that um, that that actually improves quality of life in the countryside because land per person increases, and so and so in equilibrium in a two sector rural urban model. If enough people urbanize, there's actually increased opportunity in the countryside, and that should raise incomes there for the people who remain uh, from just a simple supply and demand graph. What, what I like very much about the question is a weakness in my research is with my urban focus, I have not done enough thinking about the agricultural sector. At USC, I have several students. Uh, Rajat Kochar is working on Indian agriculture. Islamul Haq is working on Bangladesh agriculture. So folks, I have been working, my PhD students at USC have been teaching me about agricultural markets because I know so little about the issue. Um, and that, and um, in my next life, maybe I will be an agricultural economist. Uh, but, 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 but to summarize my answer again, in a two sector model of rural and urban sector, if enough people urbanize, th there will be increased opportunities for those who remain in the countryside. Okay, thanks, Matt. And that that's, suggests that the adaptation in rural and adaptation in, in urban spaces uh, have linkages that need to be uh, need to be looked into and understood um, because each has an impact on the other. Uh, I'm going to the next one. Um, a uh, question from Kalyani Pal. Will crowding out effect be reduced if we go for public-private partnership for insurance and infrastructure building? I think that's a great question. My mother asked me that question. And, and, and the truth is the devil's in the details that I, I certainly believe, uh, and I'm from New York City, there have been very successful cases of public-private partnerships where the two entities work together and so, so I'd say it like this, if the, di if the pessimistic crowding out dynamics that I sketched, if that becomes accepted, if that strategic response becomes accepted, I become more optimistic that public-private partnerships can mitigate that issue. 
So I'd have you think a little bit of our work is like a chess player. If you can anticipate this bad equilibrium of the game, reasonable people working together can, can avoid that bad outcome, if that makes any sense. Thanks, Matt. Um, the next question is from uh, Professor Gopal Karipodi, um, who's from your university many from many years ago. Uh, so he, this is, he says the talk is superb, uh, but I'm more interested in knowing about Matthew's views about peri-urban area development as an adaptation solution and and and, and adaptation strategies. So I actually wanted to talk about this. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a question there. Um, Jagdish, you're going to roll your eyes at me. I have a new book coming out in April on the rise of work from home. So I'm going to send you another book of mine. Um, in a, my new book says the following, Zoom and work from home in the United States is going to become even more prevalent. So I met Aparna in New York City. And, a, and New York City was a great place for me when I was in my late 20s. But over the life cycle, there's going to be people who with work from home will want to live close to their mother, or if they have special amenity hobbies, may want to live in a different part. Uh, so John, if, if I can ask a question, is there discussion in India about educated people leaving the cities, even post COVID, because work from home would allow them to live um, far from the cities if, if if has there been a discussion in the news about this or are people going to want to be in in bombay and new delhi that that's where the action is or is there a discussion of the spreading out of india into the periphery so i can just mention information that i have from from uh, in karnataka so i do know that some folks from who are in the it sector in bengaluru uh, and Mysore, they went back to their uh, native towns in Sitsi, in Uttar Kannada, other, other districts in Karnataka, and have started working from there. And, and that did happen during the pandemic. Um, I am, and uh, of course, there are, uh, before the pandemic, of course, there were lifestyle choices being made by certain professionals to, to move out of uh, polluted cities and, and so on and go on. And, and, but those, I think, was uh, fairly affluent folks or, or with a good question. Uh, but this phenomenon of people going back to smaller towns and working and or to their villages or homes and working uh, because of good internet connectivity. So that was an important point that I noticed that even from sitting in Sirsi, they were, these folks were able to work for their firms and continue to do that during the pandemic. So that's just one insight I have. I don't know whether there's enough information on data on, on, on how, how widespread this phenomenon is. And Jagdish, if I can ask another question. In the United States, there's been an, and I, I wanna come back to the periphery again. In the United States, the, my student, Nate Baum Snow, wrote a famous paper that, that the American construction of the American highway system caused suburbanization. So in the urban ecology literature in India, is there a discussion that a consequence of building India's new highways is to cause sprawl? Uh, um, has that been thoroughly researched on the causal effects of infrastructure in encouraging people to decentralize? Uh, that I don't know whether the I, I'm actually not I don't have the uh, I haven't really looked at the data or information, but I can just mention a few other things. I mean, the this this um, this, this uh, whether uh, investment in these uh, highways and, and new highways has transformed itself into, into, um, uh, into movement of people to certain towns along the way and, and so on. I, I don't know whether there's enough information or data uh, because there's been some massive uh, highways being built across the country and whether uh, how, what impact it's had on smaller towns and villages um, on the periphery of these uh, linear developments. Uh, I am actually don't have the capacity to be able to uh, comment on that, but I'm sure there are other colleagues here who may have done work on, on that. So, so one follow-up I'd like to make, in the United States, as you guys know, cities have formed near the airports, like near Dulles Airport in, in, in Virginia. Uh, and so out by these, it would interest me at India's new airports at the fringe of cities. Are we seeing new little cities pop up there and the oh, implications yeah, that, for yeah. sprawl? 
Yeah, that I think is evident to almost everybody here. I mean, in just in Bengaluru, as soon as the decision to um, for the location of the new airport came in, I mean, the the transformation of northern Bengaluru started in 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 many ways, and and um, and you can see that. Uh, I'm sure that there are examples, um, whether it's Gurgaon or whether Noida or or whether many other. Uh, um, and uh, Dr. Jyoti Parik uh, put her hand up. Uh, Jyoti, you want to come in? Um, yeah, uh, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah, no, I was just saying that, uh, uh, you know, mitigation has business models like uh, renewable and solar, and there's, uh, there's a whole uh, revenue streams associated with mitigation, which is not the case yet for adaptation. And there could be some examples of uh, such business models like, of course, air conditioner itself is a business model both for adaptation and mitigation. But uh, the, the city waste management, city, uh, uh, you know, uh, people have to widen now the, the sewage pipelines, water pipelines, everything. So that could be seen as uh, business models for adaptation and encouraged. Uh, the, uh, this are just comments. There are many other things that we should list out and, and ensure that that has that takes up. Because otherwise, uh, people just think adaptation is a local issue and that never gets done. Because uh, you can't expect so much expertise in local people uh, to come in and, and finish the matter. So I agree with you. One optimistic point I make in my American books real estate chapter is the following, but, but I agree with everything you said. Um, if Matthew owns an expensive house in Los Angeles, and if it faces new fire risk, and if that's common knowledge that climate change has increased my home's fire risk, because we live in like Calabasas, uh, an area that now faces fires, I will not be able to sell my expensive house at that high of a price. And, and so if, if it's common knowledge that there are these new place-based climate risks, property owners have strong incentives to identify adaptation strategies because if they don't implement these like vegetation trimming or having a roof that's less flammable, if they don't make these investments, their assets can have a much lower resale value. So an implicit assumption in my work, going back to the efficient markets hypothesis from finance, is that, that as place-based assets like homes reflect the present discounted value of their future rental flow. And, if the, and that if that's the case, then there is an incentive to invest in adaptation to keep the resale value of that asset high. But uh, I like your point very much. Yes, yeah, just uh, before I go on to the next question, because it's a related issue, uh, the peri urban spaces, at, at least in, in the Indian context, are going to be very important from the point of view of uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. And how we transform them is going to have implications for this, for, for the urban, rest of the urban spaces as well. And there are some interesting inter experiments happening on, on growing organic food in urban, peri urban spaces. Um, and also discussions on 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 um, on how uh, blue and green infrastructure, biodiversity friendly um, sort of um, building uh, designs and so on can be uh, fostered and encouraged in in peri urban spaces because they they are then in some sense the continuum that connects uh, the city spaces to uh, other ecosystems like rivers and forests and mountains which. Yeah. And so that's so there is, I think, uh, an interest in in the. We need to really, I think, invest a lot in, in urban ecology work in the peri-urban spaces. So that leads me to the, uh, the question. Uh, Jagdish, if, uh, yeah. if I can follow up, uh, yeah. what's very important about your point, and if I can critique my own book. So I'm looking at Aparna; she's already tired of me. Uh, a, 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 a weakness of my book is is related to something you just said implicit in several arguments in my book i had the american army corps of engineers use uh, using engineering and concrete to build levees and seawalls and that's very different from natural capital there wasn't enough 
because I don't know enough about blue and green infrastructure, I didn't have enough sophisticated thought in my book on whether civil engineering solutions are a complement or a substitute for ecological solutions. And I think that that's a very promising topic. Uh, and, and, and so, Jagdish, I, 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 your point tr triggered this uh, assessment of my book. Oh, thanks, sir. So that gives um, an opening to the next question from, uh, from Surya uh, Jedikunda. Um, India is planning 100 smart cities. What data-driven approaches can these cities follow to show some promising results in terms of biodiversity? So something that I talk, uh, so when I was a professor at the UCLA Institute of the Environment, there were several excellent ecologists like Tom Smith, who were my colleagues. What I would ask in such a project is for there to be a catalog of biodiversity in these cities and to see if nature is becoming more resilient over time. So the New York Times just had an article that there's now more oysters in the New York City rivers, and there's now otters swimming in the New York City rivers. And so this resilience of nature, so one test of whether these cities are making a comeback is whether, though, is whether metrics of biodiversity are increasing over time. Um, I think that's my best answer, but I think that's a very interesting question. Okay. Um, so the, the, so this next one question from Salman is, uh, there's no adaptation means available at individual level, like the case of effluent water and river flow. I think uh, what policies is required? I think it's about, you know, when you, when you have, when you're living next to, I guess, a polluted uh, drain or, or, or a, a space in the city where, where uh, you're right next to uh, something, um, it looks like the adaptation options are limited. I think that's what Salman is uh, hinting at. So I agree. Um, in my, in the world that I want us to live in, I would want to know why that family is living there. Are rents very low there because of the pollution there? And what was that family, if they're a poor family, what is their affordable budget set to adapt to that challenge? In the United States, the water has become much cleaner in the United States and economists credit deindustrialization and the Clean Water Act. I haven't seen enough research on India's rivers on whether the environmental Kuznets curve optimism holds. Is India now rich enough that economic growth is associated with the cleaning of these rivers? But, but I agree with the point. Let me add one more point. In this age of big data, it would interest me if India's cities are installing more and more sensors to measure BOD and, 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 and COD and other indicators of water quality and, and then informing the people who live in these areas about what they're being exposed to. Uh, so, so Jagdish, even, I, I have to explain my ignorance. Jagdish, is there an optimism in the Indian environmentalist community that information empowers people? And is there more and more information about toxic releases and population pollution exposure? Yeah, I, th I think that there's been a lot more uh, because of, of the, sh the shocks that people have had from, from very poor air quality in, in uh, Delhi, um, as well as from, uh, from flooding and other extreme events or, or heat stress in other places. Uh, I think there has been a lot more uh, interest in, in, in the space in terms of, of, of research. So one example is uh, my colleagues uh, in Atri, um, uh, Priyanka, they did a very good study of how urban sewage water being used in uh, peri-urban agriculture uh, results in, in, in exposure of both the, both the farmers as well as the consumers to, uh, uh, to, to um, harmful levels of, uh, of heavy metals in the food. Uh, because, and, and, the, and the demand for that particular crop, uh, baby corn, uh, is, is a lot from, from, you know, any Indian Chinese restaurant in, in, in a city in India would be using quite a bit of baby corn. So, so it was making that connect. And I, I think that, that urban consumers uh, are, uh, I think, much more informed now about some of these 
And there's also been a debate of whether uh, how how well we should be treating Bangalore sewage and utilizing it to irrigate uh, uh, farms in in nearby Kolar and other districts, uh, so that you you are actually that's like in, like in some sense an adaptation to the pollution problem that that you will take a little longer to, to clean up the water. So meanwhile, can we use this as as a uh, uh -huh. as an adaptation? And Jagdish, if I can ask a question. Did any companies try to come out with organic corn? Did, did any companies try to enter and compete? Does the government certify which products are, do not face these water pollution issues? Or would, would the people believe that? Uh, so in, in the United States, as you know, there's organic food certification. Has, has that begun in India as a way to reward a company that has cleaner food? Uh, well, there are... There are uh you know shops uh, and uh, across the city in, in some of the bigger cities which uh, which have uh, access to to farms that um, that are supposed to be certified as organic farms so there's a lot more demand for that it's also more expensive uh, there are certain states like sikkim which have a policy to promote uh, organic agriculture and also declarations in terms of of uh, of, of you know transforming say uh, tea, uh, conventional tea to organic tea, and and that's promoted, and and uh, that's also exported, and and things like that. So there are even Tamil Nadu too. I have heard about uh, support for farmers who have switched to organic, uh, and usually it favors some of the larger farmers because they can invest more in, and and so on. So I think this is an emerging area. There's also greater consumption of um, healthier millets. Uh, by the urban classes, uh, upper classes in, in some of the cities. Uh, and so, you know, what used to be consumed by, by, by uh, in the rural areas is now being, uh, I think there's a greater demand for those minutes in, in, in cities and towns. And those are also well, less water intensive. So there's a less, a less of an ecological footprint there. So these That's are areas example. where I think a lot more work needs to be done. I agree. Um, so there's a next question from um, from Animesh Naskar is, is whether there's any data available which shows that the carbon emission across various entities, example slums, emission from vehicle and multi-storied housing societies in an urban location, so that government can easily frame the policy. Um, so I guess that the emission levels from people uh, with were in different. Uh, straight off of, uh, in terms of the economic uh, gradient, as well as where they're located and whether that type of um, spatially explicit carbon emission information is available. Uh, so that's. So I, I'm going to put this into the chat room. I love this question and I want to tell a brief story. Folks, I'm putting it into the chat room right now. There is an atmospheric scientist named Kevin Gurney who I have written a paper with, even though I've never met him face to face. And he has this Vulcan project where at least in the United States, but I think he's now doing it in Europe. He has methods to, to do just what that last excellent question asked of how to use remote sensing to measure carbon footprints. And so guys, I would have you get in touch with Kevin Gurney and tell him that I sent you because it would be very interesting to take his methods and to bring them to India and to India's slums. I, I absolutely agree. And he, I mean, he's a very good guy. He was kind of shocked at how I was using his data. And then we became co-authors. Um, because, um, because what I love about that question is, is remote sensing is a powerful tool um, for measuring what's going on on the ground. And I, I think this is a, a very promising detective tool. And, and he's not an economist, he's a real scientist. Yeah, thanks, Matt. The next question is from Sheetal Patil. Uh, thanks, Professor Khan, for a very thought-provoking lecture. Assuming we find a sweet spot within the golden triangle of self-protection, private insurance, and public investment, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be like creating more climate risky frontiers as we might face new problems due to crowding in a few habitably favorable places? Are we ready to take on such a spiraling problem? So I love this. In my discussions with Paul Romer related to charter cities, um, so Paul Romer launched that project on charter cities where 
a question in urban economics is, do we have enough cities? Uh, so Jagdish, I'm going to ask you, in a moment, I'm going to ask you whether India, I don't know enough about India, I'm sorry to say, of whether India is creating any new cities, like those entities near the airports, of a point that Paul Romer was making was, a, while he lives in New York City, and my mother lives in New York City. The problem with New York City is it's, it's an old city that already has its rules and it's already set itself up. Paul Romer talked about if we create new cities, it, that there's a blank slate and you can have new rules in that city to run an experiment about what works. Um, so Jagdish, I'm not doing a great job answering the question, but with that preamble, is India creating any new cities or does India face the same challenge that the United States does, that it's hard with existing cities to get new rules of the game in place to experiment and try new things? Yeah, I just mentioned that, you know, we had a earlier uh, program called Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Program. And, and it's new avatar in a very, in a very different scale. It's a smart cities program. And my understanding of it, limited understanding of it, is that the issues of, uh, of uh, climate change risks, um, the sustainability and biodiversity and ecosystem services uh, are not addressed adequately in our imagination of what a smart city should be. Uh, maybe it's been improved because of, of inputs from experts and so on. But my current understanding is that there's a lot more work that is required for us to really define what is a a smart city in, in, in all its dimensions of sustainability and resilience. And I don't think we are there as yet. And if there are any folks here who know more, much more about, about this, uh, I know I have colleagues and friends who, who work on this much more than I do. But uh, uh, Srikant, you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. No, I just wanted to say that because, you know, in my earlier um, uh, uh, avatar as the director of the National Institute of Urban Affairs, um, we were very closely working with the government of India on the national urban renewal mission that uh, Jagdish just mentioned. So Jagdish, you may remember I was a director in IUA uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, you're right that uh, that whole idea was, uh, you know, just put uh, old wine in new bottles and it was called Amrut, the Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation. So the the government of India bureaucrats are very good with this alphabet soup. Uh, the smart cities, as far as I know, really didn't go anywhere, though it has it has a great sort of, uh, um, you know, there was this whole idea with, with you know, um, creating these nice buzzwords, um, smart cities, um, maximum governance, minimum government, and so on and so forth. <laughs> but um, the, the unfortunately, the smart cities ideas, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, and since I had worked in this urban space uh, a fair bit. Um, I don't think, uh, unfortunately, uh, it has gone anywhere. But uh, now, Jagdish, that I have uh, managed to insert myself into this, um, into this conversation, would you permit me if I just made an oral question to, uh, to Matt? Of course, of course, please. Yeah, go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry if I've jumped the queue because uh, this is going really well the flow of the questions and everything is awesome. I just wanted to make one high level comment, um, uh, Matt, because you are obviously like the new Julian Simon. You have taken a sledgehammer. You have really taken a sledgehammer to, uh, to a whole bunch of things, you know, and uh, it's breathtaking the amount of uh, things that you have. Uh, and since I've read your book, I'm, I'm you know, and I, so I'm not going to make a very long intervention. Um, that wouldn't be very fair, but uh, just a couple of very quick points. One is, of course, on adaptation, where you have said at the macro level that the damage function is going to start, uh, you know, getting better. So I don't want to get into that comment. That's a, a, a little bit more technical. So I'm not going to get into that. But um, if you permit me, Jagdish, I, could I just say a few things about the air conditioning discussion that went on? Um, I think Jagdish is muted. Um, so <clears throat> the um, uh, couple of minutes, Srika. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, the 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 screen share uh, is that uh, the Saif probably put back the slide thing. It was nicer to see everybody on the screen. Uh, you know, uh, Matt, this whole binary about air conditioning is of course very true. And let us remember that we sitting in this audience are all English speakers, 
middle class uh, indian so we are already speaking to a kind of a a narrow segment of our country uh, of course very important segment if i may put it in terms of policy makers and you know many of us educated abroad or getting the best education the fact that we are connected on internet so we are we are we live in a world of binaries you know so uh, just to give you two examples there was a very famous film in india called three idiots which was about um, education and there was this guy called farhan and you know when uh, they go to his house and his father says that uh, you know i put this air conditioner so that my son could study and do better in the exams this this uh, these three young men are in a very competitive engineering college and uh, this resonates with what you said in your book that uh, students who are taking some exams after being in a very high hot uh, uh, temperature are doing worse so the whole idea of air conditioning enhancing productivity whether you know my colleague rohini somanathan's paper that you cited or the the anecdotal thing i told you from the movie or in all our personal lives you know let's be very honest almost all of us sitting in this room have air conditioners uh, we use air conditioners we know how they enhance our productivity um, and of course i've also like you lived in singapore for uh, a long time well i lived for a long time i don't know how long you were there and lee kuan yew uh, being singapore being on the equator lee kuan yew said that the greatest invention of human civilization was the air conditioner now you know having said all that and having used this word binary i just want to just say one thing that would it be that we could think of an alternative way because you know indigenous technologies of uh, keeping ourselves cool have evolved and that you know because you talked about blue infrastructure and jagdish and all from a tree would really come into this because you know if uh, uh, if you know uh, 130 uh, 1.4 billion indians started using air conditioning it would quite be quite cataclysmic and i say this with uh, a lot of hypocrisy because i am using one so it's not that i'm saying that you know uh, people don't have a right to you know manage heat better but i was just thinking in terms of urban design we actually lost a lot of this knowledge um in terms of building thicker walls or you know doing so many things you know that you see how in delhi which is a very hot extreme climate uh, we had so many technologies to keep buildings better uh, done so i was just thinking that you know wouldn't it be uh, a good idea to at least think about a kind of an alternative a world uh, which is not just okay air conditioning or no air conditioning but and maybe jagdish you are you know you are also sort of a person who may also want to comment on this i'm sorry for this very long intervention but uh, just some of these uh, thoughts uh, no i i love it uh, my my co-author and colleague sahil is with us and you have me thinking that in the survey we're going to try to implement in some slums in india that's an excellent point of what are the local strategies for coping so that comes back to that first bullet point i had on helping one's family to be safe and comfortable and you're right it's not just simply do you have an air conditioner or not there can be a continuum of strategies and so a point well taken and i i and there's an optimism to your point because if there is a wider menu that then even the poorest of the poor have some capacity to protect themselves and so i i think that that's a very worthwhile point so can i come in match i just want to mention and also Please. in response to shrikant as well that uh, uh, you know the in for, for in most of the experiments and innovations in in urban uh, architecture as well as in urban landscape planning will have to um, reduce the need for for air conditioning and uh, there is lo lots of examples where the choice of building materials uh, architecture the use of of uh, green and and blue infrastructure in terms of water bodies or 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 shady trees and vegetation through vapor transpiration and, and latent cooling all of that i think will have to be part of the solution so we really want uh, people to use uh, uh, fewer air conditioners if we can with whatever we can do in terms of of uh, other things and i think that needs to be uh, encouraged and and uh, and uh, be part of our building codes and things like that and and then over and above that if we still need to have 
for uh, for product reasons of productivity, then at least we would have uh, less of that. Maybe I mean that's because most of our many of our buildings in our cities are not suited for uh, for uh, taking advantage of of some of these things that the the, the architecture, the, the the building materials used, designs are are certainly not uh, uh, you know uh, keeping in view the to trying to reduce the need for for this type of uh, you know, air conditioning and things like that. So, from the from the energy efficiency point of view, they are fairly. I think they're they're quite poor. So that's just an aside. And I'm going to go to the next question. Next couple of questions. Are how are we doing on time? How much? I think we have five minutes left. Yes, about right. You're about yeah. Yeah. So I think we can maybe we can squeeze in a couple of more questions. Uh, one is uh, um, from Anapurna. Um, you mentioned successful adaptation that can help bring down the social cost of carbon. Can you please elaborate on this? What if we cross the thresholds of tipping points? Can we still say this? Can can we still stay the same? I think or say the same. Yeah, say the same. So, in my last discussions with Marty Weitzman, we debated whether in a spatial economy are there tipping points. Ed Glazer of Harvard argued the whole world can live in Texas in six-story buildings. Uh, so there's a very interesting issue of how we configure our planet in a spatial economy. Of course, there's questions of what we eat, how we dispose of waste. Uh, but, uh, but part of my optimism, and, and I realize uh, you guys are very good listeners. I realize that I did not prove a theorem on that point. But uh, my argument that the social cost of carbon could fall is evidence of that. Um, I didn't talk about my paper of the death toll from natural disasters. Per person, natural disasters are causing fewer and fewer deaths. And, and the death count is smaller in richer countries. That's one example of my optimism that the social cost of carbon is falling. I posted that to be provocative and to get you guys to think. So a different way of rephrasing that the social cost of carbon is declining is that we're getting better and better at taking the punches of mother nature. And I think we should continue to debate that, but that's my core hypothesis. And one indicator of that is the death toll from natural disasters. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'm going to, I think I can squeeze in one more question, certainly. Um, this is from Ashwin. Thanks for the great discussion. Looking at financing with a climate lens means that there should be some sort of forecast-based financing. In your experience, how much are the financing institutes geared towards this, especially in urban infrastructure? So in the United States, Wall Street has been going wild recently about ESG investing of BlackRock and Goldman Sachs. So I don't know in India whether um, the financial sector, it, it, economists have been amazed in recent months, perhaps because Joe Biden is now our president. Wall Street is embracing the ESG agenda. Um, the Wall Street Journal poses cynical questions of whether this is just greenwashing. But I think that Greta Thunberg could be very happy with Wall Street going forward, that, that this mindset of the double bottom line and of identify, not investing in coal-fired power plants, investing at a lower interest rate in wind and solar, that these are ways, of course, that finance can play a role in accelerating the green economy. Um, let me leave that there because I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the motivations of the financial sector for why it's gone green and whether whether Wall Street will be wise enough to identify how to efficiently allocate their funds. They've always sought out high risk, I'm sorry, high return, low risk strategies. I mean, conference. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm good. There's going to be one last question, and that's from Aparna Sony. Um, are there any lessons from your extensive work on China that show differential behavior uh, patterns in urbanites in China versus the US? So in China, 
successful people continue to live in apartments. The super rich have these homes at the French. But Aparna, something that Sichi and I find very interesting is that upper class people in China live this Manhattan lifestyle of living in apartments. So Aparna, if more Americans were willing to live in apartment buildings, coming back to something Jagdish said, America, too much of America is zoned for single family homes. And that means that we don't have the wetlands and green space and urban heat island abatement effects because so much of the land is concrete. If we, if we lived in more apartment buildings the way people in China do, I think there'd be much more flood protection and you could make progress on the urban heat island effect. And so, I, so to, to recap that, my big puzzle with China's cities is the continuing that the equivalent of the American dream in China's cities is to live in a nice apartment building rather than a single family house. Thanks, Matt. I think uh, uh, I'm going to end the, the session now. And, you know, it's been a wonderful time having all these discussions. And I would also like to thank the audience for participating um, and, and engaging with us in great detail with your insightful questions. Um, so once again, it's been a pleasure and a privilege being part of this. And uh, I guess a round of applause to everybody, Matt and all the participants I agree. who made this so, a great uh, morning. So I'm going to go to bed and dream happy thoughts, and I hope a part of returns by you best. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good day, folks. And it's great to see old friends again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Good night. And we'll be back at 11.30, please, for yes. Malukhanna. Yes. Yeah, just stay, just stay signed in. That will be good because the next panel will be on the same link. Uh, you can just stay signed in. Uh, Professor Madhukhanna uh, will speak next at 11.30 a.m. So it's efficient that we all stay here, go for a little break, and then come back. All right. Thank